question? No. Okay. Uh, next section is creativity. Yeah. All right. So creativity. This one's a cool one, I think. Creativity. Uh, this is actually different than what you think. Most people think creativity is like <coughs> just coming up with things. That's not necessarily what creativity is. All right. So here's an example. Is this creative? Is that is that creative? No. Hold on a second. Has anyone done this exact series of strokes before? No. No. So I'm the first person in world history ever to do this with these colors on this board in this pattern. No one's ever done that. Therefore, it's creative. No. Why is it not creative? It's not helping. Well, it's not that it's not helping anything per se. But, but you're right. But what's helping make a point? <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, this isn't creative, uh, and again, this isn't, I know some of you mentioned the modern art thing, postmodern art. I'm not actually criticizing that, because uh, some of that stuff uh, is creative, and, and, I'll, and maybe I'll explain why. For something to be actually creative, it has to be novel, so that means it's new. This is new. No one's ever done this before, at least in this pattern. Uh, but unless it's valuable, then it's just, then it's just random, essentially. Is that almost every time I speak, almost every sentence I give or dialogue I give, that's the first time in human history anyone has arranged those words in that order with that inflection. But that doesn't mean it's creative. It's creative when it's new, no one's done it before or thought of it before, and it's valuable in some way. And yes, art can be valuable, and, and, and we'll talk about how here in a second. So creativity isn't just, oh, it's new. That, that is part of it, though. Uh, but it also has to be somehow useful. People have to appreciate it, it has to be valuable. It has to make their lives better in some way. People have to uh, uh, recognize that it is helpful or useful, uh, and that's what actually technically makes it creative. Uh, you could argue about semantics on that, but that's a pretty well uh, agreed upon definition of creativity. New, novel, and useful, all right? Because otherwise it's just random, all right? Because I could just throw marbles in my garbage. Look how creative that was. No one's ever put marbles in the ground that way and that and with that distance in these colors, but that doesn't make it actually creative. So creativity, novel, something new, original, plus valuable in some way uh, to people. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you this too. Truly creative people are novel, yes, uh, but they're also generally very smart and have high IQs. I kind of referenced this yesterday. Why is it that people that are creative are generally good at generating new ideas and novel things that are valuable, and they also happen to be uh, particularly smart uh, regarding uh, IQ and problem-solving abilities? Why is that, do you think? Why would those two things be positively correlated? Because they are. Does it have to do with the right hemisphere? It does, and that's where you have your imaginative problem-solving thinking, so yes. So, but that's not entirely uh, why, I would say. Because again, I could go to a college, for example, where there's a greater portion of high IQ people than other places. Uh, and are all of them creative? No, but the ones that are creative uh, do often have high IQs. Is it that they just have like a short-term memory, how like, you have like a little, little phone <coughs> that you're constantly using? That's with problem solving. So yeah, if we're talking about problem solving, yeah, that's helpful. That way I can take in information and sort of keep this banked to think about while I'm talking with you or thinking about it or trying to understand something complex. That's why working memory uh, often is positively correlated with, with uh, intelligence. But uh, why would creativity uh, usually require also pretty high intelligence? Because again, they are positively correlated. I should first, by the way, talk about how insanely rare this is. So first of all, it's rare to be high IQ. And then it's even more rare to be creative and have a high IQ. So creative people are probably the most rare as far as at least one of the most rare uh, phenomena as far as uh, abilities go. Is it because like, they're able to think of something that's different and like, innovative compared to like, the normal like, standard? Yes, so that's part of it. And that's the novelty part. And that's super hard to do. Like it's very few people actually have creative ideas uh, because they've either been thought of before by somebody else uh, or they're somehow not valuable or effective. It doesn't mean that you can't, uh, but 
if you take a person that has a high IQ and is creative and a person that's, I don't know, average, uh, and you watch their whole lifetimes, the person that's creative with high IQ is gonna come up with way more creative things than the average person was. Will they still come up with some creative things? I'm sure. Uh, but you're gonna have way more uh, from the person that's uh, got the, the high IQ and the, the, the creativity marker can, can think somehow in different ways and come up with new solutions. So the reason why, by the way, is most creativity has to do with uh, utility or value. Uh, so for me to come up with something that's valuable and uh, useful to people, I'm usually solving some sort of problem, usually, not always, but I'm usually solving some sort of problem. Um, so creative is, uh, is Elon Musk. Why is he creative? Yeah, the guy for Tesla. Why is he creative? Why? He shot a Tesla into the surface of Mars. Right, yeah. Well, it was SpaceX, right? Did he actually, because Tesla and SpaceX are different companies. Uh, I know he might have had a Tesla thing, like one of the rovers is technically a Tesla. I don't know that, but, but that's his, that's his uh, company, right? So. Uh, most of the companies he starts and the things that they're doing in those companies, has anybody ever done those before? No. no. And do all of them, for the most part, revolve around solving some sort of problem, some bigger than others, but are they all trying to solve a problem? Yeah. They are, right? He's worried about you know, extinguishing life on Earth one day, so he's exploring going to other planets. Uh, he's worried about global warming in the future, so he's trying to get uh, cars to be, uh, fo focus more on uh, non-fossil um, uh, fuel-based uh, uh, power sources. Right? He's also, I don't know if you guys ever heard, he's got the Boring Company. Have you ever heard of that one? Mm -hmm. It's a great name, by the way. Because uh, Boring, I like to bore a hole. Uh, the company is actually for boring holes to build tunnels underneath cities so you can reduce traffic. That's his idea. So he cleverly named it the Boring Company because it's kind of a boring concept. And it's like boring holes. But anyways. So... Uh, He's got a bunch of companies like that, and he helped with PayPal and all that. Uh, so you'd say he's creative, uh, but he's solving problems too. And again, that's not the only thing you can do, but most creative things do reflect that. Because if it's going to be valuable to people, does it make their lives better or worse? Better, better right. Uh, and a good way to make somebody's life better is, uh, is to uh, solve a problem for them or make their life easier somehow. So most creative people, uh, they have to have that high problem solving ability, uh, and then they can also add their degree of novelty uh, and um, uh, uh, innovative thinking. And we don't, we don't really, it makes sense with the problem solving part, like we get the intelligence part of it. It's like, all right, that makes sense. Most people are intelligent because you gotta be able to think about what the problems are and think about ways to solve them, and then when you do, it helps other people out, so that's kind of what makes it creative. Uh, but not all things are solving the problems that are, that are creative. Uh, because there are artworks that are absolutely creative and valuable, but they're not necessarily solving a problem. Um, uh, or when you uh, um, put together a, a really good piece of music, whatever genre it is, I'm not necessarily solving a problem, uh, but uh, it is creative and valuable to people. Um, the way I would say that that is valuable to people is it taps into our pleasure centers, obviously. So if you listen to good music or look at a good piece of art, it gives you some sort of fulfillment or pleasure or appreciation and taps into your dopaminergic uh, reward system. Uh, so humans, since we don't worry about getting food every day anymore, we can actually focus on things that are just for our enjoyment. Um, and creative people um, have a way of tapping into that unlike other people do just somehow. And they're super, 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 super rare. Because again, you usually gotta be high IQ, that's super rare. And then they also have to be creative, it's an even more rare subset of those high IQ people that can generate these novel ideas out of thin air. Uh, that's kind of why we did that brick thing, by the way. Because there's no real easy way to look at, uh, to like measure your creativity. Uh, you can look at your accomplishments over a lifetime as far as like, oh, here's all the things that they've created that are new, novel, and they've helped people, like awards you've won, or inventions you've made, or songs you've written that are, that are actually popular and good, things like that. There's all kinds of measures you can use. But that's hard to do. It's like after the fact, it's like, oh great, you told me I'm creative at age 60. It's like, who cares? I'm already 60, I've already done my stuff. Like, you wanna find out you're possibly creative in your teens or 20s, right? Where you got a whole life to work on uh, and apply it. Um, one way they figured out to kind of imperfectly do that is how quickly somebody can generate different ideas. So how could the brick thing we did possibly give you a, an indication maybe of uh, your level of creativity? How could it possibly do that? Anyone got it? Is it because like, they're able to think of ideas that 
know, we normally wouldn't think of. Right. Most people thought of, because I gave you three minutes, I gave you more, I, I said two initially, but I gave you three. I give you three minutes to think of as many different uses for a brick as possible, right? Mm -hmm. uh, most people had 10 or less, uh, and then it, after we got over 10, it was already pretty low by 10. But then like the further up we go, it was, it was almost no people for the most part, right? So, and again, it's not a perfect measure by any means, but it kind of may indicate your ability to at least generate novel ideas. Uh, think in ways that other people don't. It doesn't mean you're special in that like you've cultivated this and it's because of your own accomplishments. You just kind of get it or you don't get it. It's kind of there or it's not there in your brain. And we don't know where it works because we don't even know where ideas come from. It's like, I understand you can learn something, like you see this pattern and then you uh, replicate it, right? Makes sense. But when you like have no pattern and you just pop some new idea out of nowhere that no one's ever thought of, where the heck did that come from? Uh, that one we don't actually understand yet. And again, it's really hard to measure. You can look at lifetime accomplishments, it's like, yeah, but then it's all behind you already. Uh, or most of it is. Uh, this is kind of a way to maybe look at how your brain might operate relative to other people. All right. So if you got a bunch of people and you're near the top of generating even random things like that, then you might be creative, or it's an indicator that you probably are more creative than the average person. So are like like scientists like Albert Einstein? Yes, they are, because, like, Albert Einstein especially, like, nobody had the ideas he had. He came up with, like, five or six major life-altering, civilization-altering ideas in, like, a year. It's like, most people work their whole lives and don't get one. And he's just like, ah, brrr, like, five papers and changed everything. So, yeah, uh, scientists absolutely can be like, Jeff Bezos, he's technically creative, because, like, no one did any of the stuff he's doing right now. So he's solving a problem, he's doing it in a way that nobody else ever has. So, yeah. That would, that would fit the current definition we have for creativity. Uh, and hold on a second, guys, don't pack up yet. What I want to say is, uh, just because you think maybe you aren't creative for whatever reason, because again, it's super rare, guys. Uh, don't like take that as some negative thing. Most people are not. You can absolutely still bring value to the world uh, in other ways. Uh, it doesn't mean that like you're not like you're less of a person or anything like that because like there's only a few <coughs> Einstein's Elon Musk's Jeff Bezos's uh, pick up whatever artist uh, for, for visual art or, or musical art you want they're insanely rare for that reason because there's almost none of them so that doesn't make you any less of a person by any means but uh, we'll keep talking about creativity uh, tomorrow <clears throat> so creativity left off on well we just started it really and I talked for a long time because I, I actually love this topic so creativity, just to recap, uh, it is not an arbitrary thing. It is arbitrary in our definition, but it's, a, it's a, an agreed upon definition. It's a novel, which again means new, original, plus valuable, right? Because I can do something new and original just by doing random things, uh, but it, that doesn't make it actually valuable. Uh, so most people that are, are, are creative, again, ones that people can create new things, novel things that generally people appreciate or find valuable, uh, they usually tend to also have what? What is usually also highly correlated with that? Yeah, IQ and uh, creativity are positively correlated. Ooh, here's a good question. So again, I, I, I said this yesterday, just because your IQ is high doesn't mean your creativity is going to be, and you could also potentially be creative and not have a high IQ, but it's not common. Um, why are the two probably linked? Why do I probably have to have good uh, problem solving IQ as well to uh, have this creativity? Because they're able to think in ways that other people don't. Okay, but. And create like new ideas that you know the normal person would see. Okay, that's true. But like, why would I have to have the? Uh, why would I probably have also have to have a high intelligence to go along with it, or at least problem solving ability? <coughs> you would have the high problem. Uh, a good problem solving ability that way you could like find different solutions to current problems like yes okay so the solutions themselves <coughs> might be novel or creative or new but the fact that i can recognize the problem and come up with a solution at all i generally have to have uh, really adept high, uh, problem solving skills so i have to be able to take in information find patterns uh, apply them to the situation and come up with a solution and if i can do that in a novel way uh, then that would be considered a novel thing a creative original thing that is also valuable it fixes a problem for people all right, uh, and again, this is insanely rare. Uh, 
But what the cool thing about this is, because it's so rare, almost all creative things are made by this little subset of people. So like, usually you'll have this, a few people that are really creative, and there's almost none of them, and then they create an insanely large amount of stuff. All right, this is the reason why uh, major artists, the ones that are timeless, that, that keep making uh, good records, like they don't just have like a one-hit wonder disappear forever, it's because they're actually creative. Like they can sit there and keep generating this stuff. Uh, whereas most people can't. You might get lucky, make a one-hit wonder music or, or movie or whatever, but the ones that consistently do it and people consistently enjoy it, that's because they're one of the few people that are genuinely creative. They can really tap into whatever it is in our brains that generate new ideas uh, and it just comes out of them. Uh, so they can do it like limitlessly. Um, and, and again, just because you don't have that ability, uh, don't worry that. That's like saying, oh man, I'm not born seven foot tall. I guess I'm worthless. It's like, no, that's... There's almost no seven foot people in the world. Um, expecting to be that is, is not something that you should uh, uh, value, value or not value yourself based on. Uh, that's preposterous. But it is kind of cool uh, to know that this tiny subset of people create almost all of the things that are uh, creative and, and useful in the world. Here's another example. Um, if I said classical music, uh, who do you guys think of? Mozart. Mozart, okay. What? Bach is Baroque, but yeah, okay, fair enough. Baroque, you might lump in Beethoven, it's technically kind of that romantic transition. But nonetheless, those are common names that, that you hear. Uh, why do you think that is? <laughs> yes, so they are creative and successful. They made a lot of stuff. So all of the stuff that you might know, I'm not good with familiar with the names, but uh, uh, what's Beethoven's big one? Which symphony is it? Ninth. Ninth symphony? That's I forget the actual names because I'm not a music instrument. That's, that's right. Yeah, it's perfect. Never mind. Whatever it is. Uh, these major hits that we could all recognize if you played them, if you don't remember the name, like I'm not remembering the name right now. But, um, oh, like Tchaikovsky's Overture of 1812. Everyone knows that one. Yeah, uh, there, I remember that one for some reason. He's one of them as well. Uh, most of these guys were the ones that uh, are known for it because, well, theirs was the best at the time. It was most popular. People valued it. It had some sort of inherent beauty or, or novelty that people uh, valued. But um, they made a ton of stuff for the most part. I saw a chart once about these major artists, and uh, not only do they have most of the music we know, so like if, if you take all classical and Baroque and Romantic compositions, these like four or five guys are like more than half of the music we all know, which is pretty crazy. Uh, when you consider that there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people writing music and you only know about five to 10 of them, uh, they make almost all of the music. But even if you take their stuff, the stuff that is successful that they make is a tiny subset of all the stuff that they make. So it's like, I have a 100,000 artists and only a few of them actually get popular. Uh, and then even if I took that and blew it up, here's all the stuff they make and only a few of their compositions actually uh, make it, are, are incredibly popular. There's a couple exceptions. There's one guy uh, who I forgot, he actually had a really good uh, success rate on his songs. The amount of compositions he had compared to like Mozart, Beethoven, etc., was much lower and he had just as many hits. Uh, but most guys have to put out, or girls have to put out a ton of stuff uh, for it to actually get noticed. Uh, and if you want to stay there, it has to be genuine. Like you didn't just get lucky and throw one out and made a good one and that was it. Uh, the ones that generate the stuff consistently, they're the ones that are genuinely uh, creative. And you do have to have a pretty good IQ for the most part because you have to, again, be able to recognize the patterns uh, uh, in life or in music or whatever and, and be able to uh, create them spontaneously somehow. And again, we don't know where new ideas come from. They just appear. Uh, and then you have to be able to put them out there and, and people value it. So uh, most creative things are, you know, useful things, things that make our lives easier and better, right? So uh, you can think of a lot of new technologies that this would apply to, right? Like the guys that, uh, uh, the initial researchers that created the circuitry for computers, like that didn't exist anywhere before. They just came up with that, that team of scientists. And that information in the internet became public. Uh, and then of course, other private companies took it and ran with it and expanded on it, made their own versions of it or whatever. Uh, and it's just insane that they just created this thing that never existed um, out of nowhere made all of our lives better. And you can look back in scientific history and technological history and just see a ton of these, and it's ridiculous uh, how many there are. But it's not just like scientific things that actually make our lives better. It can also be music and visual art and things like that. Why do only a few people, why are, 
why are they these so few people so successful? Like, what are they doing that is causing us to say, wow, that art or that song is really good, and all the other ones are all right, but they're not as good or as novel as this one? What are they doing exactly? Because there's actually a decent psychological explanation for this. Because most people agree on what good art is. Even if I had no idea who they, they were or whatever, and I showed you an array of paintings, uh, you would consistently, or people would on average, consistently pick the ones that are traditionally held as good. So it's not just like, you think that Van Gogh is good because I've told you Van Gogh is good for 10 years, so if you see a Van Gogh painting, you're like, oh yeah, that's a good painting. No, if you knew nothing about Van Gogh, and I showed you Van Gogh and a bunch of other uh, post-impressionist painters, Consistently, people on average choose those paintings as being um, a better quality or more appealing. What are they doing exactly? Um, they're appealing to people's interests, and um, when they appeal to people's interests, they're more likely to listen to that type of music or like that type of painting. Well, I'm talking about all people though, because you're right. Like you can have genre-specific things. Like my wife hates EDM, and I like EDM, so like. <laughs> She's not going to like most EDM songs, and I will like a lot more than she will. But I'm talking like universally. People can look at these things, and a large percentage of them consistently say, this is better than this, you know, if I took two paintings and compared them or whatever. Even if they can't say why it's better. Is it because it's truly something that's like new and not done before? Like it's like a that could be part of it, but even if they don't know it was new, like, uh, like even if there were other Impressionist painters before, and he's using a different form of it, but it's still Impressionism, uh, they still would rate these works as better than the others. And the question is why? Because, I mean, look at, they got a bunch of paintings up there. It's not like some of them are just really good at drawing in the lines. Like, these are all different brush styles. Some are blurred, some are realistic, some are abstract. Uh, and yet, people generally, on average, consider these things to be better than their contemporaries, like the other people at the time that made these styles and genres of paintings. Why did they uh, become the best? Because uh, they're playing into the commonality of mass yeah, I, I think you're. I think you're kind of onto it there. Uh, here's the best explanation I've heard, and I might imperfectly uh, say this because this confused me too. I like. I get the technological stuff. It's like that makes our lives better. It's convenient. It makes sense why we would all like those things. Like, who doesn't want a smartphone? I get that some of the older generations like no, blah blah blah. You know, it's like okay, but there's no way you can tell me that your life isn't improved. There are some drawbacks like social media and all that and your attention span and you know being addicted to apps. And I get it. That's they're negative. I'm not saying it's all positive, but the net positive is better than the net negative when it comes to smartphones, for example. Right? You can get a whole lot more information, communicate much better, it's just far more convenient. Um, so I got those, but I was like, well, why the hell uh, is is art creative? Because it's so arbitrary, right? Like I like this better. It's like why? I don't know. You could probably try to explain it, but like, why can I, I can show it to a million people and they consistently choose these ones as better? Why is that exactly? The best explanation I've heard for this is that we humans, um, evolutionarily, it's not just us, it's other animals too, but evolutionarily, there are markers for something that is healthy. So how can I look at something and know that it's healthy? What? It color. Okay. It might have certain colors, but yeah, I, color could be an indicator, right? Can you look at somebody and tell if they're uh, sick just by the color of their skin? Yeah. Yeah. You can, right? It'll be generally paler, right? Or maybe they're, uh, you know, experiencing a, some sort of fever, so they're sweating. Like, you can kind of see it on them. Okay, that's one. Anyone want to know another one? Because they've also done tests for, like, uh, uh, beauty, right? They'll take pictures of people, and people are consistently rated as attractive or more attractive than others and it doesn't matter what the population is, what age it is or anything, they're consistently picked. Why would that be? Uh, I was gonna say facial like, expression. Too. No, with the same expressions. So like, all, let's say it's like, here's 20 guys and 20 girls and they're all smiling with the same lighting and the same clothes. People would consistently vote. There would be some, uh, obviously, uh, abstraction, but people will consistently vote certain appearances as uh, better looking than others. Yeah, it has to do with symmetry, right? So, one of the things that humans look for uh, are certain arrays of colors, uh, because uh, they kind of explain this one as like he, early primates would go out looking for fruits, and some of these fruits would you know be certain colors, and we'd find that particularly uh, attractive. And then some people are like, well, the frogs that are really colorful are poisonous. It's like, yeah, fair enough. But most things that are colorful like that, like flowers, that's a sign of health. They're vibrant. Right, if something's dull or miscolored or uh, uh, has any sort of appearance that's unhealthy, uh, to us it's kind of like a, for lack of a better phrase, like a turnoff essentially. 
right? We like the things that are vibrant and uh, glowing um, and look like they're youthful. So when you, if you use uh, colors correctly like that, it can have that effect. Obviously not all those paintings do, uh, but a lot of them do. The other one is symmetry too though. Symmetry is important because, uh, and we look for this unconsciously, and that's how they rate faces for the most part. People do, without even knowing it. They consistently rate the faces that are uh, more attractive than others based on symmetry. So those of us that have you know, two sides of a face that more or less align with the other, uh, closer to perfect, are generally seen as, as more attractive. Uh, and that's also a sign of health, because if uh, somebody is um, experiencing something like uh, some symptom of sickness, uh, or they had a, a mutation, uh, some sort of like, whether it's a genetic disease or an environmental disease, you can actually see that uh, in their body in symmetry sometimes. So like if somebody, I don't know, uh, has an infection, that'll swell up. Uh, if they had some sort of birth uh, effect deficiency from genes or whatever and their bones got mangled, that would be asymmetrical. So there are little things, and that's just two of them, the color and the symmetry are just two of them. Uh, those are two components that we automatically look for, uh, even, though we're not re we don't, even though we don't realize it. And so s when some of these paintings and works achieve that, whether it's harmony or it's smooth uh, or it's uh, a good blending of colors, or it's uh, vibrant colors, or it's symmetrical to some degree, uh, or realistic. Um, we, for whatever reason, favor those as looking uh, better than others. And that's on average, by the way, right? Because if you look up there, and I told you all to pick your favorite one, everyone would, there'd be, there'd be some variance, obviously, uh, but we can pretty consistently predict which ones most people would find to be uh, better or, or superior. And there's, there's a weird sort of human scanning uh, uh, reason for that. Oh, why is that valuable though? Like, okay, we can all agree. Uh, if you look at the data, it's pretty clear that people prefer certain features over others, even if they're not realizing it. But like, why is art valuable? It's like, what does that do for my life? Like the cell phone make, or the smartphone makes my life way easier in many, many ways. How does a, a nice painting improve my life or a nice song improve my life? Yeah, exactly. Since since we've devised this, you know, uh, social structure and uh, set of technologies that we don't have to worry about dying of starvation every day. <coughs> Most of the world doesn't anyway. Certainly, the developed world doesn't, um, and we're not worried about the things that were a, an everyday part of our ancestors' lives and all other animals. Of literally, just kind of trying not to die each day. Um, we can now just figure out the things that make us happy automatically and just focus on those, right? Since again, I'm not worried about starving or, or dying of thirst every day or being murdered by some rival clan. Um, and again, those things can happen and they do, but they're much, 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 much rarer in our lives to the point that most of us don't think about them in a developed world. Um, we can just focus on the things that we find rewarding that give us pleasure. Uh, and that's where uh, we can focus on things that are aesthetic, like making buildings and statues and uh, music pieces and, and visual art pieces that are uh, pleasing to us, that uh, are rewarding to us, and, and we can see that reflected in our uh, dopaminergic uh, reward centers in our brains. So that's the value people get, right? Since they have the time and money to focus on leisure, uh, they can fill it with things that we humans sort of find appealing or attractive or, or better. That's what we can do. And again, I'm not saying that one type of art is better, but we can pretty consistently look at genres and artists and pieces and the general population on average tends to favor certain ones and that's the reason why they're popular. It's not just reputation. Although, there is something to be noted about reputation. Once I make a couple good pieces and people know my name, they're gonna keep looking to my stuff and I'm much more likely to get attention than somebody who has not been discovered yet, but nonetheless. I was gonna say, like, um, does it have to do with like, grouping things too? Like, does it say you wanna like, match like, an outfit like yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, there are definitely patterns that we find aesthetically pleasing with color or shape or composition or proportion, uh, and they, they tap into that. And I don't think, I can't say no, but uh, I, I don't think many of these artists go in thinking that ahead of time. They just make something themselves that they can visualize and create that's pleasing to them that also everyone else finds pleasing or a lot of other people find pleasing. Right, so it's not like I go in thinking, huh, well I know humans like this and this and this, so if I want other humans to like this, I should do this. I don't think that's part of many people's creative process. They just 
see a problem or want to express how they feel about something and they have a vision of it in their heads or, or they make the vision as they're creating it and then it, what pleases them ends up being pleasing to most people and they can do it well and they can do it multiple times, uh, which is why they become famous and stay famous and most people never get famous and if they, or they just do it for like one thing because they just happened to randomly think of one thing that lots of people like. That's what a one-hit wonder is. Uh, I don't know how many one-hit wonders you guys can think of, but there's uh, there's plenty as I was growing up where like you hear this song by a band, you're like, that's a good one. And you listen to the other songs they have, you're like, oh, that's, I don't like those. And then you never hear another song by them again uh, on the radio or, or on a Pandora station or whatever. Um, so yeah, that kind of helped me understand it. I don't know if it helped you guys understand it, but uh, technologies and improvements, uh, obviously people find valuable, but also, um, Various forms of art, music, etc. Uh, those are just, of course, playing to our pleasure centers. Um, appeal to pleasure centers. And again, we can actually focus on those now because uh, people have time and they don't worry about dying. Like, there wasn't much in the way of human art and uh, writing and things like, well, there wasn't even writing more than 4,000 years ago, but there wasn't much in the way of art and literature, and poetry and song, you know, even a few hundred years ago, certainly a few thousand years ago, because people didn't have time to, to try to figure that stuff out or uh, express themselves or create things. They were literally just worried about not dying from random plights that plague us, like bacteria, which they weren't even aware of. So disease, is, is probably a better way of phrasing it. Disease, other humans, other animals, famine, drought, you know, just not having uh, my wife and child die during childbirth, which was incredibly common. Uh, the odds that your kid would make it to five years old before the 19th century was like 50%. So like half your kids would die. And then your wife had a 20% chance, I think. Maybe it was 10%, whatever it is, it's too high, of just dying in childbirth too. So it's like, I don't know if you can imagine what that's like, just regularly having, um, uh, if you're a guy, just regularly having your kid and your wife die in one shot, it's like, well, what am I supposed to do now? Like, that'd be just awful. Uh, and then on the flip side, if you're a kid or, or a wife, like the odds that the, your, your husband or, or dad's gonna die are extremely high. Uh, because there was common warfare and men are always the targets of that. Uh, and then men also had to do the more dangerous jobs, generally speaking. Um, and that's before there were safety standards and technologies for that. So, you know, men dying at work or at war or violently was a pretty common thing prior to the, to the 19th century. So all of these were things that people didn't, were, were focused on and they couldn't just focus on creating things and acquiring knowledge. So we do, so appreciate it and uh, make, make, uh, make use of it. Okay. Um, so do we understand uh, creativity, what it is, why it's valuable, and why it's so rare? Okay, uh, and then it is so rare. So if you find, if you think yourself are possibly somewhat creative or know someone that is, uh, try to, try to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Take advantage of it. Try to take advantage of it. Oh, one more thing I want to say before I keep going. Do you think that creative people do better in college because they often have better IQs than most? Do you think they do? They actually don't in college. There's actually no correlation between creativity and uh, performance in college. Uh, the best indicator of that is your uh, conscientiousness, which is like your orderliness and your industriousness, and IQ too. Uh, but creativity, there's no relation whatsoever. Why do you think that is? Is there a whole lot of room for utilizing creativity in a class? No, why not? Yeah, you're basically just learning things, right? Now there are exceptions. There are classes where like you have uh, you know, like engineering, art maybe. Even for art though, you're kind of like, yeah, you're, 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 well first of all, you're learning your skill, but yeah, it is structured in that like you focus on certain uh, elements of art, you know, rather than just doing exactly what you want, which is fine. Uh, and it's important to hone those skills and most people aren't creative anyway, so why would we focus on this tiny subset of people uh, that we don't know? how they create their ideas in the first place. Oh, that's the other thing I wanna to mention too. You can't develop creativity. You either have it or you don't, like I mentioned before. We don't know why, but it's, it's somehow a part of some people's brains and not others. Uh, and uh, while you can, of course, you cannot give kids opportunities uh, like, you know, uh, uh, access to uh, adequate food and nutrition and education in the course of their creative, or they would've been creative, they're not gonna realize it if they die, or they're malnourished, or they're not educated in the first place. Um, but as long as they have those things, and most of us do here in the developed world, 
you either can be creative or, or, or not. And again, what I mean by creative is genuinely uh, provi uh, providing a consistent uh, supply of novel original things that are valuable to people. Uh, it's not something you can teach. Uh, and you can't teach it because it's like, how do you teach somebody to create new things? It's like, there's not like a process for that. You might see a problem, but it's like, okay, now think differently about this. How do you think differently about it? Like, there might be some steps you could take to try to help out, um, like gaining other perspectives, but for the most part, it's not a skill you can teach. You just kind of have it or not. Writing, you can kind of teach a general structure, but I mean, uh, as, as far as going beyond that, you're just making stuff up and there's no way, no way to teach you how to make stuff up. Um, going back to like the college thing, yeah. don't you kind of need rules and regulations to create as well? Like, it wasn't the you do, yes. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned that actually because I probably would have forgot that. Uh, people think that you don't want to have rules and limit people uh, or have structure because that will stymie or prevent or inhibit their uh, creativity. And like that's what I would think too, honestly. It's one of those intuitive things. This is why we don't use our intuitions, damn it. Uh, you would think like, oh yeah, it's like, the, it's like the raising a child thing. It's like, oh, if I'm strict, then the kid will never realize the potential or become creative or whatever. I'll be controlling. Uh, but when you don't have a structure and you don't have rules and you don't have order, there can't be creativity for the reasons that we just talked about. Like if we didn't have this organized structured society uh, that um, has these structured jobs and rules that maintain the peace and allow us to operate with these market systems that provide us with, with food and water uh, and state systems that enforce the, these contracts and uh, 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 entities and things like that. If you don't have that, you can't be creative. Why not? Yeah, you're too worried about your existence, right? You're too busy uh, worrying about providing for yourself and or your family. Uh, um, you know, not dying from famine, not dying from uh, uh, thirst. Um, if there's no structure or order or rules, we wouldn't have these nice organized health systems and hospitals and things like that, so you're on your own for disease. Uh, and they wouldn't have even invented those things in the first place uh, because there was no place or time or money to sit down and figure out how these damn things work in the first place. So it actually turns out you do need uh, a certain degree of order and structure and rules uh, to maintain order so people are stable and safe and then they can you know, have the things they need to live and then do the things they want and then focus on um, uh, being creative, right? So we don't mean structure as in I never let you try anything new, but uh, there are some things that you do need to learn about the world, how to conduct yourself, uh, how society works, how to interact in society, and then you can, uh, when you have that stable structure around you and you're not worried about basic necessities, uh, you can focus on tapping into the creativity you, you do or don't have. So it's, it's more of like a, a macro view than a micro view. Macro meaning like the whole of society. If you don't have rule structure or an order, none of the creativity can happen because no one has the time, money, uh, or uh, 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 brain power to sit there and, and think about things and create them. Because again, they're just too worried about not dying or protecting their stuff essentially, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? It's like, yeah, go out in the jungle, um, uh, into the hunter-gatherer societies in, in the Amazon or in the, uh, in, uh, the Indonesian archipelago, or uh, uh, I think there's even a few areas in the savanna that, that still have hunter-gatherer societies. Go out there and be creative. It's like, you won't be able to. You'll be too worried about rival clans around you, finding enough food each time, uh, dealing with basic, uh, diseases that pop up, uh, droughts, things like that, other animals, you're not going to be able to sit there and <coughs> utilize technology or, or buy things from other people uh, or borrow their knowledge because you're all just trying not to die, basically. Anyways, so uh, that's creativity. So now that into the more technical parts, um, there's kind of two-ish types of thinking or uh, knowledge, no, not knowledge, but ways of thinking about a problem, solving it. There's, uh, or I guess just should say problems themselves. There are problems that just have a, a simple fixed answer, like a, this is the problem, this is the only solution, right? Uh, those are things like, um, you know, one plus one equals two. That's the only actual answer for that one. If I say three, even if I'm a postmodernist and I try to deconstruct it, it's one plus one is just two, man. You can literally see it, it, it works arithmetically. Uh, it's consistent, and we can see it in the world. Even if it's not reality, it's part of our reality, and, and we can uh, accurately predict it. So that's called um, convergent thinking. Damn it, markers. Whoa. Oh. 
convergent thing. <laughs> it's even more impressive because I can't see the garbage can from where I am. Convergent uh, versus divergent. So convergent is um, uh, where, again, you just have the one, one problem with only one solution. Uh, so that's, again, 2 plus 2. The only answer to that is actually 4. Now, again, the symbols and uh, words that we use to describe these are uh, arbitrary, but the actual, whatever number you use, or whatever symbol you use or word you use for it, whatever represents 2 and 4, uh, 2 plus 2 is always going to equal 4. All right, there's only one answer to that. All right, so what's divergent thinking then? Like when there's multiple ways that you can solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Is there only one way to get a refrigerator up the stairs? No. no, there's multiple. Now, there might be some that are better than others. All right. Uh, so just because there's an infinite amount of ways I can get the refrigerator up to the top of that third flight of stairs or whatever, uh, doesn't mean they're all equally valid or valuable. All right. So uh, give you an example. Which one sounds better? Uh, you and uh, your, uh, I don't know. Well, let's just say there's a some weightlifter, right? You and this weightlifter and a dolly uh, taking it up the stairs, the two of you, uh, or you have to do it by yourself uh, with a rope. Which one sounds like a better option? The, the help with the weightlifter and the dolly, right? Uh, could I do it with the rope? Yeah, probably. Some of us couldn't actually. Uh, I think a good amount of us probably could eventually. Uh, but, uh, and while they're both equally valid in that they can accomplish the goal, are they both just as valuable or good? No, there's definitely one that would be better uh, as far as like exerting effort and time and, and, and all that. Probably less damage to the, uh, the stairway itself. By the way, I saw this clip once of um, uh, these people that were proud of carrying this refrigerator up. It, it was like three of them. I can't remember where they were. I think it was in Poland. Uh, and they, they took a picture of how proud they were for doing it. And then uh, somebody replied uh, in the comments with uh, a video footage or a link to a guy who had the exact same refrigerator, the same model, and he was all by himself. And he put the, he somehow picked the thing up, put it on his back, got on a bike, and then rode away. And I was just like, what? <laughs> it took three of you to do that, and this guy put it on his back on a bike. And it wasn't like a, like a, a, a yoked bodybuilder, by the way. It looked like just a regular dude. I was just like, wow, that's impressive. But anyways, so that was funny. But anyways, uh, divergent is when there's uh, multiple solutions. And again, this does not mean that all solutions are equal as far as uh, their effectiveness. Uh, they might work, but some work better than others, again, regarding uh, effort and uh, uh, resources uh, and time. All right, uh, but that's an example of divergence. So, and there are a lot of most, in fact, you'd find most situations in life are divergent, right? If you have uh, an issue with a person, there are many different ways you could probably go about resolving uh, the issue. There's also many ways to go about making it worse, too. Uh, that's why it's, it's divergent. And this is where the creativity comes in, too, because you'll probably initially think of a few ways to solve a problem, um, but if you're trapped by your own mental set, um, you could potentially benefit from uh, uh, other forms of, uh, other ways to solve the problem by adopting the perspectives, of, or hearing the perspectives of others. Or if you're a creative person, you can just kind of create an endless number of solutions. What happens to me when I'm thinking of things, um, is when uh, I think of something, like I'll initially have a few ideas about something, and they pop up in my head, and I think about them, I write them down or whatever, and then when I think of one, it makes me think of others that are related to or associated with it. So it's like this weird, endless cycle of, I have one idea, which reminds me of other concepts that spawns new ideas, and then those ideas remind me of associations, another concept that think of other ones, and it's just this network that keeps growing and going forever. Uh, which is pretty ridiculous. And I found out uh, about this, and that this was different, because I assumed everyone does that. Uh, and then I found out, not even like five or six years ago, uh, when I was uh, with my friends and we were playing this game, uh, you know, the big Jenga one, right? The big blocks mm -hmm. Jenga. And there was this, uh, one of my friends saw on social media, like an idea of like attaching rules to some of those blocks, like things you'd have to do. And uh, there's only like five rules, and, but there's like 40 blocks. I was just like, oh, there's only like five rules. Like, I'm repeating rules is boring. I was like, hey, let's all come up with like, I think there was eight of us. 
I was like, let's all come up with five, and then, uh, and then we'll have one, e we'll have different rules uh, for each of the blogs. He's like, okay, cool. So I wrote down my five ideas. I was like, okay, a few minutes went by. I was like, oh, what do you guys got? And then, like, everybody had like one or two rules. I was like, what? And I was like, no, like, this is supposed to be easier. I was like, fine. And then I just did like 40 rules by myself and just put it out there. Only because uh, when I would think of one, initially I could only think of a few, but then those ideas would open up association networks of other ideas and just it just kept going forever. It's like, oh, then that one can actually be part of this rule too. And, it, and so it just keeps expanding. Um, but I didn't know that that most people can't do that. Is that similar to like retrieval cues? Um, I could, I don't, if it reminds me of something, it would be. But I don't know how to describe it other than like, you know, things can be associated. So like, uh, here's an example. Well, I gave you an example yesterday when we did the brick thing, right? So as soon as I said smashing a, a walnut to open it up, like a month, all of you guys are like, oh, and then all of a sudden you had other ideas that would be similar or a similar function of that. So once you think of one new way of using it, because like I could smash a nail, it's like, okay, I could smash a snail, okay, and it's like, then I could smash a walnut, or, or the, just the thought of me smashing something like the nail, it's like, oh, I could smash other things, okay. So I'm nailing something in, I, I can't just say I'm smashing other things into things, but I could, I could destroy something, right? Could smash the snail, like what else could I smash? It's like, that would be different than just destroying, you know, a snail in this case. It's like you could smash a walnuts to open up to get the nuts. It's like that's three ways of using smashing for three different things. But I only thought of the other two because I thought of smashing initially. So I think, oh, smash. Well, what else could I smash? I could smash these things. Oh, this is kind of like uh, um, opening something up. What else could I use to open it up? And it, that's just kind of how it goes, at least in my head. So it's like I get these weird expansive networks. So maybe that's a strategy you guys could use now going forward is uh, what else is kind of like this or associated with it and then you'll find that the ideas keep going. <clears throat> Anyways, that's convergent and uh, divergent. Um, so there's kind of ways to foster it. Again, you either have it or you don't, which is, you know, it sounds pessimistic and it's like, oh, but that, that means that you can't do anything to make it better. Well, you can actually. You can have a, a, a structured, consistent uh, surrounding so that you can actually focus on these things and learn them and hear new perspectives and have new ideas. Uh, so an environment is, uh, I don't remember exactly how I worded these, by the way, uh, but you definitely want a, um, uh, I don't want to say stable environment, accommodating environment. So again, what I mean by that is it's stable. You're in a society where, yeah, there are rules and things like that, but I'm not worried about basic needs and I have at least some time in the day to think about um, solving problems or doing creative things. Uh, no, you go to the bathroom though and grab some. Um, other ones are, uh, if I, I think I, I think the technical term for this on the, uh, uh, on the, on the book I just got this from years ago is Venturesome Personality, but that's mm -hmm. probably pretty vague to most of you guys. People that are high in what's called trait openness, we'll talk about this when we talk about personalities in two units. Uh, this is openness to experience. So tell me why this would be an advantage. If I naturally enjoy going out and seeing new things, why am I more likely to be creative than somebody who doesn't enjoy seeing new things and does the same stuff over and over? Yeah. Because um, like, um, conservative people like, tend to like, stay on the same um, tradition. Yeah. Okay. Why does that make me less creative if I'm doing that then? Okay, what do you mean about the new ideas? That's more important than the comfort zone thing. Uh, like, um, you, um, you refuse to like look up the new ideas, or you just like remain on one idea. Okay, yeah. So wh when I do open myself up to other ideas or cultures or ways of thinking or whatever, that gives me new perspectives, right? So that's kind of like how what we did here, even though a lot of you saw in the notes. Once you figured out that you can look at the letters as the first letter of something to find the pattern. All of a sudden, you have a new way of thinking about that. Would you come up with that on your own? Maybe, in enough time, maybe. Uh, but it was much quicker if you just heard it from somebody else. Now, all of a sudden, you have that trick, and you're like, okay, if I see that, I can think about what letters might that represent. Uh, and, then, and now you just have that tool. Whereas before, I wouldn't have. If I never uh, went out and got that idea from somebody, that new perspective, I would not even think of thinking that way. All right, so basically, by being a high in openness or having a venturesome personality, you get a lot of new perspectives and ways of thinking, and then that can uh, uh, speed up the way you process or problem solve things. That's kind of how to do it. Okay. Um, the other ones. So, 
openness, so that's vengeance and personality, accommodating environment. Oh, by the way, that can mean uh, uh, stable and safe, but it can also mean people who are actually supportive of you being creative. So if I go to a company where they never let me try anything new, like how they used to have guilds back in the old medieval times and whatnot, and they wouldn't let you try new techniques and things like that. Obviously, there's gonna be like zero creativity because you're required to do the same thing. But if you're in a job that um, shares ideas, or um, that's not as important because we have the internet, but or sort of gives you the freedom to do what you want, that's going to allow you to be more creative. And that's actually related to the third one, which is called intrinsic motivation. Um, there's intrinsic and extri extrinsic motivation. What's the difference between the two? Anybody know? One is like intrinsic to being intermotivated, right? Yes. So you're not motivated by anything outside of, other than your own interest. You're like, man, I just like this thing. It's just natural. I, I for whatever reason, I'm super into, uh, 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 you know, whatever it could be. I like uh, well, psychology. Let's just say I like psychology. Does everyone here at school like psychology? No. no. A lot of people do, but uh, did uh, is there something that, uh, let's say that class over there doesn't like psychology, um, was there something external that's like forcing them not to like it? No. Nope. Is there anything in here that's forcing you to like it? No. no. You all chose this class, I'm sure some of you chose it for the GPA or the AP test, but a lot of you chose it because you think it's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Did anyone force you to think it's interesting or influence you into thinking it was interesting? You just naturally were like, well, that's cool. Right, and not everybody thinks that way. So that's an intrinsic motivation. So uh, if you allow people to do things that they want, which is the environmental factor, uh, they're able to pursue their own goals and they're much more likely to uh, uh, try to find out and think of new ways and apply new ways of doing things. And that's the intrinsic motivation. I don't have to uh, force myself to think about better ways of teaching because, or I don't have to be paid for it because I naturally like doing it. If I were to come up here and just do a terrible job and then you guys all failed and I felt like you weren't learning anything, I would feel awful. Like I would be just absolutely motivated to make it better. I wouldn't need anybody to give me a raise or anything like that. I would just want to do it on my own. But if you put me in a job where I hate it, like accounting, um, and I hate it. Um, if you put me in a job like that, like there's nothing that's motivating me to do anything better or different. I'm like, oh, it sucks, whatever. How do I fix it? Okay, and then I'll just do that over and over and I'll quit because I hate it, right? But this is something that I'll keep trying new things and keep uh, improving and going uh, because I, I want to. It's, I feel bad if I don't and I feel good when I do. Whereas opposed to other things I'm not interested in, like golf or baseball or accounting, I could not care less if I do good or bad and I do not want to try to improve because I don't care. I'm just gonna leave, all right? All right, and then the fourth one is something else. Don't tell me, I'm trying to remember what it was. Motivation, openness, environment. And then there's another one. What was it though? Okay, tell me, I forgot. Expertise. Oh yeah, expertise slash mastery. I don't know why those are different, by the way. Okay, this is actually very true as well. And this is why a lot of times they run you through the mill on, like let's say you wanna be a writer. I hear writers complain about this all the time and I was telling them the same thing and I was like, oh yeah, good point. Um, they always like, they have to go through these classes where they have to write these stories, these certain structures. Like, oh, I don't want to do this stupid structure. I don't want to use this structure. That's not creative. It's like, no, it's not. Uh, but uh, this is a model that human beings, for whatever reason, uh, find to be particularly appealing. So you have to know how it works. Uh, and you can't improve it or change it until you know what actually does work. Like, if you just start from scratch every time, you're just going to suck, man. Uh, unless you're a random savant, which you probably are not. Right? There's only a couple Mozarts uh, in the world. There's only a couple... J.K. Rawlings ever in all of existence. That ain't you, almost certainly. Uh, what you have to do is you have to go through and learn how it works, and then once you have a complete understanding of how it works, you can better absorb new information and apply it, and you can better tweak things that you think might be improvements. Because you can't improve things or tweak things when you don't know what is making it successful or unsuccessful. All right, so if I'm in a field, whether it's teaching or engineering or dance or music uh, creation or writing, whatever it is, uh, I'm not gonna be able to do it well enough to be creative. And again, that means it's both novel, original, and valuable, so good to most people. Uh, there's almost no way I can do it unless I understand what about these things makes them good and or bad. So I can avoid the bad and then uh, take advantage of the new. And then I can possibly add elements to change it or make it better or make it different, but not worse, you know, that, those sorts of things. So you have to, uh, I can't fix a car. I can't make a better car until I know how cars work. Like that's just a stupid plan. 
They're like, oh yeah, I got this great idea for a car. Oh, do you? Do you know how they work? No. Well, good luck then, buddy. Um, unless you can just draw a design, maybe, which you probably also can't do very well. Um, then uh, you got no chance. So that's kind of what you have to do. You have to learn the basics of something before you can understand it, what works, what doesn't, why it is the way it is, and then you can go about possibly tinkering with it a little bit uh, for the most part. You guys got that? And you do have random savants that get lucky and just go out and kill it right away. Congrats to them. There's only a few, and the odds of that are just like one in a billion, essentially. You're not the one in a billion, almost certainly, guys. We're, we're all uh, lumped in on the... Uh, on the averages for the most part. <clears throat> All right, and you might be incredibly gifted, but incredibly gifted isn't a savant. A savant is, like I said, one in a billion. So, um, yeah, uh, and I realize those were two categories, but they're pretty much the same thing. You've really got to know what you're doing, why it works, how it functions to, to try to actually make it better, whatever it is. Make sense? Sweet.